Well, hello and welcome to the Mindset Mentor. I'm Tanya Kolar. I am always so excited that you are tuning in here um, as listeners. It's my privilege to be able to share some amazing stories, great guests that I have on the show who are educating, inspiring, and motivating the masses. And, you know, my goal is to have you living your best life. And it starts right here, right now. So my special guest today is sharing an incredible story of survival, surviving the war, escaping the war, and, you know, what that feels like, what went through her mind. Uh, Because remember that every moment in life is a choice and it's an opportunity for us to choose something. Um, And that leads us to to our next step. So it's so important to make good choices. Um, And when we're faced with challenges, challenges in life. We don't know if those choices sometimes are good, but we have to make a choice and know that wherever you are in life right now in this moment, whether you're experiencing, you know, a lot of struggles and challenges or life is perfect, you know, just know that, um, you know, it's so important to, to truly live our best lives, to find those beautiful moments in life that can make the difference in how we operate. So my guest is a coach, she's a speaker, she's an author. We're going to talk about her book, which is called Where the Roses Grow. I had the pleasure of reading the book from uh, cover to cover, and, you know, it's phenomenal. And it really takes us inside the journey of a war survivor. But not even that, it's, it was about that moment of not even knowing, you know, are you going to survive? Is your family okay? You know, what's going to happen? And that uncertainty, that certainly would create a lot of fear. Uh, we've all experienced fear in life and, and certainly collectively together through the pandemic, there was a lot of fear and uncertainty. And we're going to talk about some of the ways that my guest, uh, Nikolina Ivankovic, was able to combat some of the fear or to just be able to process the fear. So how about we just say hello and welcome to Nikolina. Uh, it is a pleasure to have you here on the Mindset Mentor. Thank you so much for joining us. And, and I, for, I want to acknowledge you right off the bat for being brave enough uh, and vulnerable enough to share your story, to write it on the pages to inspire and to help others. So thank you for that. Thank you very much, Tanya. And it's my honor to be here. Uh, as a mindset coach, you can do so much for the people. And I really appreciate the time uh, you're giving me here today. Wow. Well, you know, listen, I love that because I'm a facilitator. I'm helping people get their amazing stories out there. And, you know, I want to talk about uh, first going through your your experience as a, as a war survivor. Uh, what compelled you to write about it and to put it on the pages? So I have I felt maybe for 30 years pregnant with these stories, literally pregnant. I came to Canada in 1997 after the war in former Yugoslavia. And uh, life was, there were way more important things to do in life, like uh, get yourself a final, uh, uh, finish the education, I finished your university, get yourself on track, you know, finances and everything. And then when pandemic uh, hit, I realized that not only did I have three extra hours of my time, I'm realizing that people around me are suffering way more than they actually, um, I'm not going to say should, but that they suffered through pandemics um, and reminded me on suffering through the war. But there are so many differences. There are lessons in the war that we learned that helped me go through pandemics. So I felt almost like, okay, I'm going to do something good for the others because I'm going to write this book and tell them, look, there are worse things in life. And you still survive and then you walk and you walk out of it. And you thrive and you become richer with it. So that's what actually happened. And I started writing at the beginning of pandemics uh, and finished that. It was supposed to be finished uh, Christmas before it was finished. But my father passed away. And uh, my father passed away last year at uh, November, October 13th. So I put my life here on, on post and traveled to Croatia two times. I saw him before he passed away we had a beautiful four weeks and then after that he got uh, he got ill and uh, very quickly he passed away so my book was supposed to be uh, released in uh, Christmas that year but actually it waited for the right time um 
So yeah, and it came out in April. Yeah, I, I agree with you that everything happens uh, for a reason and, you know, it was the right time for that book to come out. And the, the timing is certainly um, uncanny in the sense that there is a war, uh, you know, happening in the Ukraine that was, you know, very close to where you were in proximity. Certainly there's war around the world um, and, you know, all war, um, you know, is is uh, devastating, you know, and, and but to have it so close to where you were, uh, how has that impact? you in um, your experience? Did you find that it really brought up a lot of your your own experience? Yes, yes, um, absolutely. When we heard about the war, um, whole my community, and I have lots of friends who survived the war, we were all feeling the same. We were shocked. We were devastating that the war of that intensity and that, that uh, geographically close to us is still happening. Mm. Uh, you know, when once you survive war, you think maybe this is the last time. This mm. is this will never happen to other human beings. But what makes you feel um, sad is that it repeats, and that the stories of struggling, the stories of uh, women leaving their husbands, the children not having the fathers, the stories of uh, neighbors being killed, the stories of your relatives being killed, of you relocating, of you going through the minefield. This all becomes again reality in somebody else's life. So, as a, I'm a member of Toastmasters, it's a, a international organization, and we have uh, Toastmasters in Ukraine. And out of uh, eight clubs um, that are in Ukraine, uh, I know for sure two were English speaking clubs. So, as an activist, for me to deal with trauma, it's usually I turn quickly into activism. That's how I help myself first. Uh, I sat down one night, I remember it was uh, probably late, 10, 11 o'clock, thinking, how can I do something about this? And I sent eight letters to all Ukrainian Toastmasters, all clubs, said, guys, you matter, um, we know you exist, and I hope you are there, mm -hmm. just so that you know you have some love from Canada. And for about, I'm pretty sure, at least two, three weeks, no reply, and I put it um, aside. Then four weeks later, two clubs came back to me. One, Dnieper Hill, uh, Toastmasters from Kiev, and another one, Art Talkers. And we, we sat down together and I was sharing with them our experience because we didn't expect a war either. They didn't mm -hmm. expect a war. There were so many commonalities in, in my stories, our stories, my friends' stories, and their stories. And I was kind of giving them some heads up, like, you know, do you, and asking the parallel, how similar is this? Are you going to have a problem with electricity? They said, no, we had a problem with electricity. Are you going to have a food chain problem? They said, no, they still have food and whatever. So these kind of things, we were trying to think, where are the commonalities and how can they help, you know, how we can help them. So finally, you know, they figured it out on their own. But I said to them, one of the things you need to do, you need to continue living your life. Mm. And if living your life for you means having ongoing Toastmasters meetings every week. That's it. Make sure you stick to it. Mm. And I'm really proud and, and, and happy to say they have these meetings going ever since. And uh, I, I participated as much as I could. I asked some of my friends to help run the meetings and we did but i see now how they're going they have their competitions going so so the life life is going on and that's what you as a single person can do you can continue to live your life to the best of your abilities yeah, you know, beautifully said. And I think that, you know, it, when turmoil happens, um, whether that is a war or just turmoil in our own lives, to whatever extent you're experiencing turmoil, um, you know, it's sometimes very difficult to be able to see that life can continue uh, and you can do things that you would normally do or some of the things that you would normally do. Oftentimes, you know, that is prohibited based on our, our situation and our circumstances. But to know that there's uh, options, I think, and to listen to other people's experience like yours, Nicolina, where you can share and say, yes, you can move forward. You can find those little moments in life that can make the situation a little bit better or a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more familiar uh, so that you can manage and cope with that day to day. Uh, you know, and it's interesting, you know, in your book, you talked about some of the little things that you and your family did 
along your escape route and journey to in order to keep the comforts of home close by. So I'd love for you to share a little bit of that with us. Yes. Um, you know the, the the book Five Love Languages, mm -hmm. right? The Five Love Languages. So it comes in different forms. And we we are brought up with them. Most of us are you we learn one or two language uh, and then through life we hopefully expand those love languages. Um, we spoke, my family spoke service as a love language, which is having the feast together. So when we were doing anything that was of any importance, we would cook together. So my mom would make, set up the table. It would be from the grandma table cloth, which we all know about and the history. Sometimes we hear about it over and over again about grandma doing it and stuff, but it's uh, evoking those lovely warm memories. She would set up the table, we would have the plates on and we would then eat, eat, have, a, have a meal together. At the beginning of the war, before the war, we had these rich recipes, recipes uh, say parfait cake that I talk about, or or oma cake, which are full of nuts, you know, um, uh, uh, eggs, um, you know, uh, sugar, um, all sorts of very good ingredients, uh, and we would make the cakes and celebrate. When the war hit us, we stick to the habit of setting up the table mm. and eating at that table together. Every day, one meal, and then we we switch those rich cakes into the cakes that were made out of ingredients that are given to us by UNHCR. UN was providing us with logistics, with the food. So we, we had a, um, the basics. We had a flour, sugar, oil, and we had a um, um, uh, milk powder. And out of these, we made a good cakes. We actually altered the recipe that we knew from before. We shared with neighbors, neighbors shared with us, and we were sharing those new recipes and enjoying them as families. Beautiful. And I think sticking to that habit was making us feel like, oh, we still have life. So it's not that the life is gone. We still have life in one form and share the love between us. As I say, we learn the love language as a, ser a service and we stick to that. And it was, it was such an important part of our survival. Yeah, I mean, it really uh, can can really aid in strengthening uh, that love, the bond, and having the mindset to keep going, to move forward, because life can really present us with so many challenges. Now, I can't even imagine what that would be like to be in the middle of a war, uh, fighting for your life, not understanding what's happening, not knowing what's happening, um, and not only for yourself, fearing for yourself, but for your loved ones, for your family, for your friends, for, for neighbors, uh, so much devastation around you, listening to to, you know, the bombing happening, uh, you know, it's, uh, I, I would imagine that the fear is so intense. You know, you talked about having that, that structure and, you know, maintaining that, that ritual of food and of love and of community coming together, right? Service providing. But there were times in that you write about in your book where, you know, there was no food. Um, and you didn't know exactly necessarily, you know, when that's coming. Um, and so in, in those moments, what did you find important? Um, and, and maybe it didn't even happen in that moment until much later when you had a chance to process it many years later. Was there something that uh, provided you with strength in that moment? So there is a story in the book about the tomato. Uh, my sister and I had the last tomato on the table and I felt urged to jump at it. She had an urge to jump at it. And we, um, that's the moment when I felt I'm losing myself, mm -hmm. that I'm going to fight over tomato with my sister. Mm -hmm. That's the moment I remember. And that's the moment I felt so ashamed of myself. And that's an actually good moment for me to say, okay, this is my boundary. This is where I'm not crossing this. I'm not going to steal tomato, the last tomato for my sister. Even I really want this tomato, I'm not going to do it. So um, not having the food uh, was one of the triggers for me to see what are my boundaries, mm -hmm. how far I can go in that situation. And then you, you learn later in the book that I reached my limits and then I decided to leave. And it came with uh, food deprivation uh, as a result of food deprivation, as a result of being um, 
uh, so humiliated as a human being mm -hmm. as a result of seeing your, your neighbors um, uh, being killed, as a result of hearing all the shelling and bombing every day to the point where I couldn't sleep anymore. Mm -hmm. As a result of constantly being under stress so that I had a constipation for 20 days. So finally, when this was all over, um, you know, I said, I'm not going to put up with this anymore. It's either I leave and survive or I just die here. Mm -hmm. um, you remember the tablecloth. It came to me um, uh, and it helped me tremendously through all of this struggle to stay focused on something. So the story is that um, I started a tablecloth uh, that I envisioned putting, the, once I finished the tablecloth and needle point, that I will put the tablecloth in my home in Sarajevo and it will be beautiful, beautiful setting for our meals. And I was doing it. And while I was doing it, it's repetitive movements brought calmness to my mind that's keeping me from going insane. Mm -hmm. And this was happening day after day, day after day, day after day. And once this was finished, I put it on the table and I was still in the same situation. And I said, that's it for us. I'm leaving from here. And I took the most dangerous trip I ever took in my life, ever. It was through the minefields. I didn't know at the time it was going to be ending up like that. But you will find that in the book, the details of that, what was happening. But um, that's that's what what actually all of this came happened. And um, um, you know, I I I didn't want to settle for that. I didn't want to settle for that. I wanted to live my life to continue living my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's so interesting that you found an option um, where you felt sort of trapped, I would imagine, you know, not being able to, to leave, being stuck in a war zone, uh, but making the decision that, okay, I, this is not what I want. Um, and just, just the act of the, the stitching, the needlepoint, creating that tablecloth, I think it's so important, and it really represents the, the importance of staying as present to the now as possible. Um, and I know that our minds can take us in many different directions when we are fearful, when we're stressed, uh, and, and we're, you know, feeling hopeless. But if we can bring ourselves back to the present, just focus on what's happening right now, um, it can help to bring that calmness. Because, you know, when we start to reach out to the future, we start to, you know, again, think, oh, no, what's going to happen? And all of the negatives, the what ifs start running and racing through our mind. And that can really add so much anxiety to to an already stressed situation. So I love that that experience. Uh, so we're going to take a short break here on the Mindset Mentor, and we will be back with more Nikolina Ivankovic uh, and her book, Where the Roses Grow. It is her story of survival, and a war, surviving a war, escaping a war uh, in Sarajevo and her journey and what she has learned, not only about herself and her family, but about humanity and uh, some really great life lessons that we can all take and use in our daily lives. You know, the wars that go on in inside ourselves sometimes can really take us out of um, our direction in life. And, uh, you know, we, we want to really truly live our best lives. And it's so important, I think, to collectively listen to each other, to share, to share stories, because this is how we learn. And, you know, it's one of my favorite things in life, um, you know, is learning, uh, reading books. I, I'm a sort of a, a self-help junkie. I've been reading books, um, you know, in the personal development space and self-help since I was about 15. 15, and I can't get enough. And the reason is because I learned so much from other people and their sh stories so that we can arm ourselves with that impetus to move forward in a way that serves us best. So stay tuned, everyone. We will be back right after this short break here on Saga 960. You're listening to The Mindset Mentor. I'm Tanya Kohler. And welcome back to The Mindset Mentor on Saga 960. I'm Tanya Kolar, helping you live your best life. You know, I know sometimes it can be very challenging to feel like you're living your best life when there's chaos and stress and anxiety all around you. But when we can zone in, come right back to the present moment, you know, it's incredible how you can 
really find a sense of peace and a sense of calm in the midst of uncertainty. So we're going to continue our conversation today with coach, speaker, and author Nikolina Ivankovic. Uh, her book that we're talking about today is Where the Roses Grow. Um, and in fact, if you're going to be watching this video, because you can watch the uh, video of this uh, today on uh, my YouTube channel at Tanya Kolar, you will see that, that uh, Nicolina has a beautiful Beautiful vase of red roses behind her. Uh, so, Nicolina, thank you so much for joining us. Let's pick up that conversation and let's talk about the roses. What is the significance of the roses to you? Uh, roses are able, very, very resilient flowers, and they can they are able to to grow anywhere you want. I've seen them in the garbage places. I have seen them in the most beautiful places in the world, in the gardens, and I have seen them in uh, in in offices, in places. So, having intention to see, to grow, to nurture roses in your life is something I want to remind everybody on their ability to do. They can anybody can do that. You can always find a rose, even at the saddest places. And even at the most happiest places, it's our uh, intention. It's it's our getting rid of our guilt uh, to do so. Because I see people have a guilt when they see so much going on around them, suffering and everything. To see the roses, to enjoy life, to live life. Don't, because those ones that suffer will never blame you for that. These people really go through their life trying to struggle, trying to survive. And you live in your life, maybe an inspiration to them. So don't forget that. If that's the reason for you not reaching out to the roses. But also to connect with my book, uh, the house we lived in was surrounded by roses. A beautiful garden of roses, all sorts of colors. And we left them when we left the house. And a couple of years later, we came back to the house. They were still there blooming. Wow. Wow. They so were after able to survive, yeah, they were able to survive the war, no watering, no fertilizers, no cutting, no trimming, nothing, nobody touched them. And there's something in beauty, you know, when you really feel and see the beauty, um, I don't think many people will dare to touch that. And mm. it can be your protection. So, yep. um, yeah, go ahead. No, I just think that's so interesting. Um, you know, the roses standing strong and tall. You know, in the, in the midst of that that war zone, and I think it's a it's a really good representation of you know how we can stand strong in our lives going through the difficult moments. And we we've all experienced difficulties in life, you know, to many degrees. Um, and so it's just nice to have that symbol sometimes, that strength, that subtle that subtle uh, you know symbolism there to guide us and to know that you know we can get through this. You know, we will get through it in the best way that we can. You know, we may not. Have have all the answers we certainly don't have all the answers in life but knowing that you know what it's going to be okay um, other people have have done um, you know done this in terms of moving forward so we can take their example we can look to the rose as an example as well you know we can find that inspiration throughout our day um, and sometimes it's even just in that moment all you need is a little pick-me-up just in that moment that is going to make the biggest difference you know in your life so I think it's really important to take a look at our surroundings right and find the good that we can in in every in every situation you know because there is always um you know a benefit somewhere down the line and it may not make sense right now when you're experiencing something like a war i mean i can't even you know speak to that because uh, i i have only witnessed it you know from a distance but i and i think about it often um you know when i see any war conflict going on in the world you know how devastating that is and i and i'm so grateful that i you know was born in a country that that i am safe um that i feel safe and to have that moment where 
you can't even find safety in your own home within the four walls of your home. Um, I, I can't even imagine what that was like. So I want to go back in time a little bit, Nicolina, if we can. Um, as a 20-year-old, before the conflict started in your country, um, you know, you, you met your husband. And, you know, I'd love to talk a little bit about that story and that, that, that sense of love that you experienced and what it was like to have that threatened as well going moving forward yes yes so i was in my 20s when the war uh started but actually uh we just got i just got married i was uh it was in 1991 26th of october we had a, a wedding um and we started our life planning our honeymoon planning our uh, walks at the beaches in croatia candlelit dinners, uh, you know, making love, all sorts of beautiful things. And six months later, we were, we escaped the house. Mm. So um, I love that um, the, the, the beginning of my life and my love story fed me through all of the struggles. And even now in life, I love to think of it, how innocent, how beautiful, how natural it was. Um, uh, my husband and I met at the tram station um we connected and you know how when you meet a person the the eyes you you meet and you look at somebody in the eyes and it sound it looks known to you 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 feel like you've met this person somehow and you bother yourself with this how do i know this person actually i think souls connect mm -hmm. that's that connection that we we have with somebody and it carries you on through um good and bad times uh knowing that you know universe god uh has a plan good plan for you i think that that can be translated into that connection you establish with somebody um unfortunately um uh, as the world was developing we had to leave each other and we lived uh separated from september 1993 till may uh next year 1994 how much is it nine about nine months um it was difficult it was it was ripping my heart up in many pieces many times but we had a different vision why we had to be so separated and i with this uh, what was going on with me through the war i think it's so hard to be separated from your family members from your husbands from your wives from your mothers from your fathers for so i can speak on behalf of all refugees and immigrants who experience this right now Mm -hmm. um, I have a, a friends uh, that I recently made from Ukraine. There is 20 women from Ukraine who came to Oakwell and they are all with their children here. Uh, their husbands had to stay back mm -hmm. because uh, they couldn't leave the country and um, they are fighting for the country, uh, but they have, have to find a way to live life here. So they are rebuilding themselves. And it reminds me on the power of any one of us, how much power each of us has when we want to we, we wanna do something that's good for, they, they probably live for their children now. They think, I am, this is all for our children. And it's good because they show, they build themselves through the process. So um, I don't know if I went away from what you wanted to talk about, but I think it just reminded me uh, that situation of being separated from, uh, my husband reminds me on how much of a pain it is for these women, for instance, birthdays, uh, Thanksgivings, Christmases, um, uh, the times when they had a little celebrations, they're all separated. And that's a, they, they literally need to learn their, to live their lives um, without the second, without the part of the family. Um, you know what they say in Croatian. You probably can translate that, Tanya, better. You, you're, you're, uh, because you, you are, you are born and raised here. Uh, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Is that the, the English yep. saying? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So if you think of this hard times for them, for these women, and you say uh, to them, "Listen, you are gonna be way stronger once you go through this," uh, or you can, you, you can give them a hope that uh, this is good for their children or something. We can actually invoke um, more of um, strength in them by saying or by 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 just reminding them that uh, this shall pass, nothing lasts forever, and and things like that. Because those are the things I had on my mind when I was going mm -hmm. through. 
-hmm. This shall pass. It cannot last for, for longer than this. Pain cannot be worse. Um, God never gives me something I cannot tolerate or I cannot survive. I know that's that's a uh, universe and God has only good plans for me, has so much love for me. And this is only because I can, I can go through this. So that mindset is the mindset of the, of the mother wife warrior who that didn't want to be a warrior, but turned herself to be just because life threw such a curveball at, at me. And, and I see at, at many women uh, right now who are struggling and going through what they are going through because of the war. Yeah, I mean, it's a great it's a great lesson. And it's a great reminder um, that yes, you know, life is a cycle, you know, every every moment in life, you know, uh, it comes, you know, full circle, um, you know, when we're in, the, in those low points, it will come back to the highs. And when you're in the highs, you know, unfortunately, you're going to come back down to the lower points in life, right? Because that is, uh, you know, the cycle of life. And we're here to learn, we're here to, to live, we're here to experience. Um, and some of those experiences, yeah, they're painful, they they hurt, uh, they're uncomfortable, uh, but knowing that others have gone through it, I think is, is really key. So, you know, for you to share your story, um, you know, with, with people who are now experiencing a war uh, and knowing uh, that they can, you know, have some guidance and support that they're not alone, I think is so essential uh, because, you know, we certainly all need each other. And, you know, there's a point in your book that I thought was, you know, pretty incredible where you were... Um, seeking help you were seeking shelter and you went to a friend of a friend right so not somebody that you knew personally you knew of a friend of a friend and you showed up on their door and they were very reluctant uh to help you and it took some coaxing for for them to actually help you but the story of how that unfolded and how it came back full circle was remarkable because you never know in life when you will be in a position that you're going to need help from somebody else now we have a hard time sometimes putting ourselves in other people's shoes you know experiencing their footsteps or what their experience is but i think to have that level of compassion um, can really help us in life to pay it forward. So if you can share a little bit of that story, you know, I, I would love for you to talk about that. Yes. It's a story about Yanya and Gyoza. Um, so what happened is it, after we went through the two mountains, my sister, my mom, and I, um, we ended up in the town that was still safe, like a safe island. Mm -hmm. They didn't have the war um happening yet in the town so they, it's not a torn war torn town uh and uh we had a, a, a address book with us when when we left um my hometown uh on this journey we had an address book and somebody gave us the phone number of uh and the address of these two people yanya and yozo so we knock on the door climbed upstairs and uh a small uh like a woman opened up the door and i said hi my name is Nicolina and I'm friend of Teta Zora. And uh, she goes, okay. And I'm like, this is my mom and sister. We just went through the two mountains and uh, we don't have anywhere to sleep. Um, so Teta Zora is sending you regards. I didn't know, actually, I, I was thinking she was going to pick up what's going on mm. from just our appearance and the little bit tips and bits. And she said, um, okay, great say hi to Tita Zora and slam the door in front of our face. Oh. So when she did that, my mom ran downstairs and saying, okay, I'm not knocking on the door here. This is it. They don't want us. They don't. And I'm like, mom, it's the middle of the night. There are so many soldiers around. There are soldiers. Uh, there are drunken men. There is so many dangers around. I don't want to be in this town with my sister and you on the street or to go to some place where we can be you know, we can be in any ways harmed or injured or, or whatever can happen to us. And she and I'm like, Mom, you need to speak now because there is a there is that respect, like if an older person speaks like an adult and stuff. So she wasn't <laughs> she wasn't happy, but she knocked on the door and she says, Hi, I'm Zora's colleague. My mom was a teacher. I'm Zora's colleague, we work together and we have nowhere to sleep. And then she's like, Okay, but I can't get you in. And and she was starting to push us back. From the back, there was a man coming in the wheelchair. I told her, like a bigger man, but in a wheelchair. And she asked, he asked her, 
um, uh, Yanya, who are these people? And she goes, well, some refugees, some refugees, as if we are interrupting their daily floor, night floor, whatever, they are, we are interrupting their life. And he goes, let the women come in. And she's like, where are they going to sleep? And she, and he goes, you'll find a spot, let them in. And I remember that let them in sound. It was so firm. It was, mm. it was like she didn't have a chance to say no to it. Mm -hmm. We came in, we were smelly, dirty after this trip. We took a shower and then uh, they put us in the kitchen on a, on a, like a futon. Uh, so three of us slept there. So there was space. And over the course of 10 days, we built a bond and then we left. You will know in the book what happens. But uh, so this was 1993 uh, in uh, September. In uh, February, March, 1994, we were in a position where we were in our cottage safe. And the bus from that area came with refugees. And I was in front of the bus and I recognized Yozo and Yan. Wow. They came out of the bus. She was devastated. He was also devastated. They went through some very hard times. And I offered them our space. It was nothing. It was very small, but I, I really insisted I said, you can stay with me, uh, you can be with us, and you will see the little twist why they first, she actually wasn't happy to accept it. She was thinking her relative will um, will offer her a space, but he, she she couldn't, so she they ended up with us. So they were with us for another six, seven days, um, and uh, the, the only challenge we had when they came was how to make the toilet for Yozo, who was uh, in the wheelchair, which my mom solved immediately by bringing the wooden chair and she cut it in the middle. So he had uh, he had a toilet to, uh, to, for himself. So I absolutely am 100% sure that what comes around gets around. And if we put it out there uh, that we, we are helping and we sincerely want to help, I'm sure help will come back to us or it will come back to our children or the the uh, the sons uh, the people that are close to us. I really have seen that, lived that, and uh, although we sometimes make mistakes and we don't see that or we slam the door mm -hmm. or we do something, we have a way to um, come back to ourselves, in, to our power that is like this, and then uh, recognize, open, give back, and receive. Beautiful. I love that. Uh, I think that is such a great story. I, you know, I was, when I was reading it, I just couldn't believe the, uh, the remarkable uh, situation, you know, the, and, and then being able, recognizing them in a crowd of people, you know, going through this devastation and being able to, to help, um, you know, and that, that level of help at that moment in time would be invaluable to anyone. And I think it's important to recognize that in life, you know, you never know um, how your words will impact someone, how your kindness will impact someone. Um, so if you're listening right now and you've been thinking of helping out in some way, um, you know, whether that's someone who is going through a war somewhere in the world, whether that's a family member who's experiencing a challenge, uh, you know, a loved one in, in your circle, you know, reach out you know, give them that, that, that extend that hand so that they know that they're not alone. Because again, you know, don't ever devalue um, what you can bring to someone. I think that is so important. Uh, you know, helping each other is essential. And I think that we, when we, when we help others, we just, it feels so good, you know, innately in your soul, it feels good. It feels right. Uh, and sometimes, yeah, you know, we can resist it in life, you know, with, with all things we sometimes, uh, don't pay attention to our intuition, um, but our intuition never steers us wrong. And, you know, if you have been in a situation where, you know, you wished you could have helped, don't beat yourself up either because we can get really stuck on, um, you know, those times in life where we feel that we could have made a better choice. But the reality is, is that you made the best choice that you knew how to in that moment. And, you know, right now, this moment is another choice. So make a choice that's going to empower you, feel good, um, and know that you have the power to make a difference, whether that's a difference in your own life or others around you.
So we're going to continue the conversation here on Saga 960. You're listening to The Mindset Mentor. I'm Tanya Kolar. My special guest today is Nikolina Ivankovic, and uh, she is sharing her story of survival and escape from the war uh, it, that broke out in Sarajevo uh, that displaced her and her family. And she's sharing, you know, uh, some really deep personal truths and experiences in her book, Where the Roses Grow. Phenomenal book. I, I I read it from uh, front to back and, you know, every page. Uh, there's always something inspiring and a lesson to be learned uh, through, the, through each of the chapters. And I think it's a lesson uh, that we can all sort of take in life and use it and apply it to wherever we are in life. So stay tuned and we'll continue after this break. Welcome back to the Mindset Mentor. I'm Tanya Kolar. My special guest today is Nikolina Ivankovic. She is the author of Where the Roses Grow, which is an incredible story about survival, escape, escaping a war that broke out. Um, and she was unprepared for it. Of course, I don't think anybody really prepares, you know, for war. And certainly when it hits, it's uh, devastating in so, so many ways. And she shares her, her story in her book. So I encourage you to, uh, you know, get a copy of, of uh, her book. So Nicolina, I want to ask you, uh, um, you know, going through the experiences that you that you uh, went through, that you you know recount uh, in your in your book, what did you learn about yourself? What are some of the key things that you discovered through the process of going through this type of devastation about yourself and and even about some of your family members? So I wrote this book with a thirty years difference from um, uh, when this happened. So I had a lot of time to heal. Uh, and I'm going to speak from this time, from this perspective, what I learned about myself. Um, when I was writing the book, first lesson uh, that I that I can share, I, I have so many lessons. If I spend 24 hours, I will probably not grasp all, all the lessons. But some that, that, that come to me right now is while writing this book, my whole left shoulder got frozen as well as the left arm. The same as what happened to me after going through the minefield. Mm -hmm. So our body remembers, uh, carries the trauma, carries emotions for a long time. And we need to be aware of that. So applying, doing, uh, practicing healing is absolutely important for all of us. And uh, it doesn't have to be the war. It doesn't have to be big trauma. It may be something we see on the TV that triggers us. It may be something... We carry the trauma with us and we need to address it because with us, it should stop. We shouldn't care. We shouldn't actually have that projected and given to our children because it's unhealed. It better be a lesson or wisdom or in a form uh, where uh, they can learn something from it. So healing is uh, our job. Healing is our, um, I think, our own, own honor, honorable task to do, uh, I would say, on a daily basis. Um, another thing I learned is that we are way more powerful than what we think of ourselves. And unless we are put in these terrible situations or, you know, um, uh, we see ourselves uh, in these situations, maybe we envision or whatever, uh, we won't know. So taking risks in life is really important. Because that's how you learn of your own power. Uh, get yourself out of the comfort zone. Think a small. You don't have to jump uh, off of the building uh, with a parachute or something. Take the small risks because it will prepare you for any type of disaster that may happen to you, to your family, to your relatives. Or maybe not. You just reach the mountains without much of a disaster. So I think taking risks is another uh, thing that, that's important. Third thing is love yourself. Love yourself like you love your best friend. Have that in you that you appreciate. Um, you appreciate that. I remember my parents were always saying, I don't know this child was, when I was young, apparently I would stand in front of the mirror and I would say, I'm so pretty. I would tell, say that in front of the mirror. Um, I think uh, it shouldn't turn into narcissism. But it's a good foundation for appreciating who you are and what you have. It can be, it's external as well as internal beauty. 
And we, we have the power to nurture nurture that through through different things. Uh, you know that I'm here your life coach as well. Uh, and uh, self-love, self-care is something that, that we can do daily for ourselves. Um, those three things and treasure friends, treasure, uh, treasure other human beings that come to your life. Uh, it, it seems maybe not, not important if your life is perfect. But when your life uh, hits, uh, when any curve, like when anything happens and woo, you may be a little bit losing that balance, uh, you be you you becoming aware of a good people around you. Mm-hmm. And I can tell you, like I spoke, I speak, I meet with um, a Ukrainian woman who is fantastic. She's a she has a master's in architecture. Came here and she is raising her son separate from her husband. And we speak and we, we we share. I share my experience. She shared hers. And um, um, uh, Anna tells me that um, working for other people uh, who don't have much of the skills, like her language is really good, helps her so much, helps Anna every day. So doing something for the others is actually a selfish act of helping ourselves mm. you know it's a circle is that the circle um uh and and we can we can all give that we can all offer that um you know and i i, I believe in beautiful living a beautiful life i really yes. do life is beautiful we can find the roses we can find them anywhere we want we can see them we can see them in us um and uh, we should be grateful for what we have. We sh- always should be grateful. If we survive the day, if it's tough, we should be grateful for that and move on. And that's how we get a momentum and live the life that, that the best we can. Yes, I love that. We can get through our greatest challenges and we can absolutely live our best life, find the beauty in every moment and every day. Uh, sometimes, you know, it feels like you you won't find it, but I can promise you if you look, it is always there. Unfortunately, we are out of time. So, Nicolina, I would love for you to be able to tell the listeners and the viewers, for those who will have an opportunity to watch, uh, you know, the video of the interview on my YouTube channel. Uh, the book is Where the Roses Grow. Where can the viewers viewers and listeners find your book i see publishing website they can order that directly from it uh, they can also download a e-copy of it or they can email me directly at nicolina at nicolina and i will ship it to them Wonderful. All right, Nicolina, it's been an absolute pleasure having you share your story. Uh, thank you for, you know, being raw, being open, being real, and wanting to inspire and help other people. I think in sharing your story, um, you know, you can pr- provide a lot of, uh, you know, hope and, and solace to a lot of people who are stuck in fear and uncertainty and not knowing where to turn in life. Sometimes when you don't know where to turn, you know, turn to others. Listen. Uh, to some great, you know, podcasts, some radio shows, read books, watch movies, find some inspiration or pick up the phone or reach out to a friend because always remember that you are never alone. So I'm sending lots of love and light to everyone out there who is listening right now. Uh, May you live your most spectacular day right now in this moment. And again, Nicolina, it was a pleasure having you here today. Thank you very much, Tammy. All right, that is a wrap for today's show. The Mindset Mentor, helping you cultivate your best life. And remember that you are never alone. You are enough and you deserve to live a beautiful life.